Welcome to our very first space, Bridging the Diversity Gap in Tech with Tyler Men Menezes. Menezes? I'm sorry, I'm so bad at pronouncing your name. Yeah, it's close enough. And Alex Para. Um, we're just going to be talking about really important topics centered around um, making tech more diverse and equitable for all. And the, the topic that we're going to start discussing today is how do your specific identities affect your lived experiences? Yeah, so uh, I just, for the, I guess, the people listening after on the recording, want to introduce myself um, a little more formally. I am Alex, and, um, you know, I'm currently an undergrad um, studying at UC Berkeley. Um, I've been involved with Code Day for, you know, quite a while now, since um, through, all throughout high school um, and college, too. And, you know, I've also done some work in the recruitment and retention um, spaces for specifically Latinx um, students. And so I've, you know, this is something I've been thinking about um, for a while now. How do we make sure that you know, we, we, we have the resources to, to try and bridge the gap. Um, but just, I guess, to, to kick us off, you know, everyone's got their, their own different identities. Um, you know, whether you are part of the um, queer community, uh, the trans community, the uh, person of color community, you know, all these different things come together. Um, and each one makes your lived experience a little different, right? You know, you are perceived differently based on what you um, show outwards and what you are. And that that already, you know, can ha bring up some difficulties in, in daily life. You know, people may not understand where you're coming from. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of dive a little deeper into why it's important in the the tech industry um but just getting like a sense of well maybe my identities um are more normalized than others and maybe they're not and so that that's kind of like where i, I wanted to start this conversation um in, in understanding that because i think that's kind of the basics for for the rest of the conversation yeah, I think to add on to that too, like um, one of the reasons that I actually got involved in Code Day to begin with, because originally it was just kind of a volunteer thing. It was like a, a part-time thing. Um, I taught high school while I was working in the tech industry um, in, in startups. Like I taught a high school class in a really low income part of Seattle. Um, and it was amazing to me because I, it was sort of the first time I had seen a bunch of students from low income backgrounds using technology. And so I sort of realized that like most of the apps that people were making did not solve problems that these, these folks had. Um, they solved problems that people who made like a middle income or, or higher like had. Um, and so like, you know, really like they didn't use a lot of the apps that, that everyone I knew was using. Like they, they were just using their phones completely differently. And that was kind of, I think the thing that opened my eyes to the idea that like, oh, like everyone has their own way of, you know, their own background, their own problems that they need to solve in their life, their own experiences. And um, if you're only building apps or something from a particular background, you know, if you grew up middle class, the problems that you think you need to solve, are, you know, it's only a subset of all the problems around in the world. And so I think like that's a really important um, reason why getting more of those viewpoints in um, can, can be important because otherwise you don't ever identify these problems at all. Yeah, and I, I think, like, you know, it, it's something as kind of narrow as that, right? Like, this this specific problem of not having apps that ha that understand, you know, these people's viewpoints. Um, but then you can even, like, start to, you know, think about other things. Like, for me, food has always been a very kind of central thing to my identity. As a Mexican-American, you know, I grew up eating a certain set of foods. And, you know, so when I moved away to college to um, a different high school, you know, even like the food was different. 
you know, I was like, hey, what is this? And, you know, get to try new things, experience new perspectives. Um, but so you start thinking, well, if food is different, what else may be different, right? So we, we've already, you know, talked a little bit about how apps are different. Um, maybe how about ways of thinking, right? You know, there there are different ways of thinking that, that come out of if you're at a maybe lower income school rather than one that has the resources to, you know, take you to whatever class, you know, computing class, um, they have calculus there, whatever. And that helps kind of shape your way of thinking. And so all of that kind of comes together, right? And you you head off to, you know, after high school, maybe you head off to college or you start working. Um, and so now you've had these sets of experiences. And, you know, start, so, sort of where the, the, the disparity starts coming from is have you had the experiences that will prepare you for a job in the industry or for classes in college? A lot of people in lower income schools maybe don't have those experiences or that knowledge, unfortunately. Um, and so that that's kind of how I, I view, you know, I, your different identities as coming together in, in, a, in a way that manifests itself in a big way um, later on. So you're talking about how everybody's lived experiences are different growing up, right? And how their culture and their life at home and just where they were raised in high school and in in college, you you know, your your only experience your only experience is what you know, what you expose yourself to. So these big tech companies are run primarily by white people who don't understand the different lived experiences, how do we then tackle that issue of unaddressed different lived experiences in higher education and um, before even before higher ed? I mean, I think obviously the the best case scenario would be getting more perspectives in the in the room at a leadership level, right? I mean, if we can get more people in leadership positions, that'd be great. And I think that's that's kind of a long term situation. Um, but you know, when we're talking about like how do we get people, uh, how do we get more perspectives um, in in the room, like earlier on, I, I think a lot of it is just making sure that people recognize like what the benefit of this is. I think that there's a, you know, for a lot of organizations, there's a small group of people who really are pushing this. And a lot of people who maybe are, are resistant and don't necessarily see it as worthwhile. So from my perspective, one of the most important first steps is just trying to make sure that people understand why this is a benefit, right? Like why this is not just good for society, but also like, you know, it, it generates like a really good business value as well. Um, I, I like sort of addressing the, you know, the, the large number of people who don't really see this as a priority is, is kind of the first thing that I would, I would go to, but, you know, in terms of on the ground tactics, I'd love to hear more maybe from Alex about what he thinks has, has worked. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, that we say a lot, you know, diversity and inclusion, and I think sometimes it, it loses its, what its meaning a little bit, but yeah, like you said, in, it's having those perspectives in the room and that is very important because it starts you know it starts kind of bringing other people in with those experiences right it, i think when you have a, a wide variety of of perspectives opinions and whatnot you start to kind of draw in other people with different experiences Right. So if when when you are in a space that is primarily white, um, they're not going to be seeking out these different perspectives, these different lived experiences, these different identities. Um, but I think naturally when you open it, when you have more diverse um, 
communities, then they naturally want to seek out people from their community, people from other communities. And I think that that's, again, a key part in, in, in the, the kind of bridging this misunderstanding in the tech industry. Um, and I think another big aspect of it is education. Um, you know, college is att- unattainable for a lot of people, but a lot of jobs require a bachelor's. So how do we reconcile that? You know, that, I think that's a big question that maybe not a lot of companies are thinking about. Um, yeah, and, and for anyone who maybe is listening to this and, like, doesn't realize this, like, interesting, requiring a bachelor's degree requires, like, either good enough credit to get loans uh, and, like, the confidence that you are, are going to be able to enter the job market and repay those loans or, like, a, you know, a lot of money. Like, it's not, it's not cheap anymore versus something like an associate's um, or uh, applied bachelors uh, is often a lot more inexpensive. Um, so that that's a pretty big access thing for a lot of the students we work with. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Alex. No, 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 no. That's that's again really like crucial to the kind of conversation, right? It, college is very inaccessible for some people. Um, I think I know in California, I think you get like a year of community college paid for. Um, in a lot of my conversations with. Um, you know, people here of underrepresented minorities, um, you know, one of the, the key kind of things that I, I see common is maybe my parents didn't go to college. Maybe my parents only speak, you know, X language. They don't even understand English. And so they can't, their parents can't even begin to help them with the, the process. So they go through it, you know, kind of maybe a little alone. Um, you know, and so that's, you know, one of the, the first barriers to even getting into college. Now, when you're there, if you're low income, you might have to work a job. So that means, you know, maybe having less time to study. Um, yeah, so that's one of, you know, the, the many things that kind of impacts your ability to meet GPA requirements. Maybe you, you know, have to um, support a family member. Maybe you have to, you know, take take care of your uh, sibling. That's something that can also affect, you know, how how you're doing in school. Um, again, if you came from a a school that didn't have a computer science course, that's gonna, you know, show up in in the disparity um, in your computer science classes when you know you're meeting people who have been coding since they were, you know, whatever age, seven, eight, nine, you know, so that, that those are kind of the, the things that are lacking, right? Being able to pay for it, being able um, to have the time to study, uh, and then having that kind of prerequisite knowledge, right? I was fortunate enough to have um, to be a legacy at the the school that I'm in, and so I didn't have to, um, you know, do that whole barrier of how do I even begin to apply, how do I begin to navigate the process. But you could only imagine how it is to not have parents um, who, you know, is yeah, like uh, you know, you were you the first to. Um, or would have been the first to, to graduate. And so there are just a lot of things that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I think even having someone that says, hey, you know, applications are due this date. Have you done this, this, and this is already super helpful. Um, yeah, I, re- I remember like when I went to high school, because I went to a high school in a, a relatively affluent area. Um, not well, like, you know, not like mansions or anything. And I went to a public high school, but it was like ki- kids whose parents had generally gone to school. And um, it was funny because I, I, I think I realized this my senior year, like I was in a few like clubs or things just because I thought it was kind of fun. And there were a bunch of people who would just like go to a bunch of clubs and not really do anything. And it wasn't until like beginning of my senior year, maybe my junior year, um, when I realized like they were just doing that so that they would have like a really competitive college application. And one, I think that's like really dumb. 
Um, but two, like, that's not the sort of thing that like anyone would have told you is something that you need to do unless you have parents who kind of already know like what the college application process is. So it's like one of those things that like is inherently favoring, uh, you know, people who have parents who not only have gone through this, but have gone through this for a really competitive college and like know, know how to, you know, how to game the system sort of. Yeah. And, and for that reason, it's, it's a somewhat of a cycle, isn't it? You know, you get there you have this experience that now you can pass on to your children your children get there and they have the you know the experience and so on and so forth um and so that's where we kind of see um this idea of like generational knowledge um generational maybe wealth right where you you kind of inherit things maybe not genetically from your parents but you inherit you inherit certain knowledges that kind of help you better in life, right? Like maybe preparing for um, a job interview, you know, maybe your parents never had a um, a job in an office. They worked uh, at a restaurant or, or um, construction or whatever, you know, job they had, but they don't know what it, like, what the standards of professionality are being professional um right so that that's kind of where it starts um, manifesting itself and leading to these kind of cycles in which you either you know break free of it or you you you, you get stuck in this um kind of not knowing what you don't know and trying to figure that out on your own um, and sometimes you know going to college helps you discover some that you have friends who say, hey, this is, you know, the expectations, this is what what you kind of need to, like, dress for an interview. Um, and so getting those different perspectives, um, again, very crucial. Uh, you mentioned job interviews, too. One thing that's, like, once someone is actually already out of school, I know one thing that's a problem, too, is, like, if you're going to a really big name school, like they have really great career departments who who are in touch with employers, they can get lots of big names to career fairs, they can really prepare the students for like what a modern job interview looks like, um, versus a lot of the smaller schools like just don't have that kind of funding. And so they're still giving like really outdated advice on to like what to put on a resume or like, I I, I don't know how much you talk to the students uh, with with labs for the, the resume practice um, things uh resume feedback things that we did but like uh one of the really common bits of feedback was basically like put your github on there and it turned out that like a bunch of students their schools were telling them to remove their github because it's not professional um and it's like if you're applying for a software engineering job like no like you need you need to have that on there if you have one like it, it's a really big like up so yeah i mean that's a, that's kind of another thing too it's just like the schools often you know the, the cheaper more affordable schools don't have the resources that the, the bigger ones do to provide that that feedback and like to the extent that nonprofits or or you know corporations or things can help students prepare for those and make sure that they know what's going on like i think that that's all really important as well yeah and i no i, I totally agree there's a, a lot that that there is to be done there one kind of relevant kind of anecdote experience that I just had actually um was I went I was invited to join the uh CS honor society here at, at my my university um and so I showed up to an info sh session you know it, it seems really cool um but I, I looked around and I sort of noticed that I was the only um underrepresented minority there at this info session um and you know they were showing pictures of their events and whatever and i was looking through the pictures and again i i noticed that there were no underrepresented minorities and so you know you have the cs honor society which has a lot of really great resources you know they they bring in big name companies and you know these are the target kind of audience for the, these companies but it's inaccessible to underrepresented minorities right that's kind of a problem in its own you know because we ha there there are these resources but they're just 
may be exclusive or not shared. Um, and so that was something that just came up for me. And I was very kind of, I was, I was very kind of apprehensive about it through the, through the, the info session, thinking about, you know, how can I make sure that there maybe are other underrepresented minorities to join me in the future uh, at these meetings or whatnot. Um, but yeah, like they, they get their, their resume reviews, their interview practices. Um, you know, a lot, of, one of the big things is uh, referrals. They, in this CS Honor Society, um, they have, you know, pretty much someone from every company. So if you need a referral for NVIDIA, you got, you have X person who can do that. If you want Google, you got Y person. So it's, it's, a lot of people don't have that kind of network, that kind of uh, support system in order to, to, to get their first job in the tech industry. So do you think that there is a huge issue with marketing towards the students of color and giving them those experiences and giving them those opportunities? Do you think that everybody is saying, you know, this is open to anyone, but they aren't really opening it to just anyone? They're only telling who they know and they're not branching out any further than that. And how do you think we can? you know, expand, you know, this sort of helpful exposure, not just to people in your college community, in the college community in general, but like beyond offering these open doors for people outside of the school to come in and see this and get feedback and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the the kind of key aspects is that there has to be student-led work. I, I don't know if universities are kind of um, willing to or are prepared to kind of do the work that is necessary um, that needs to happen in order for the, the college um, diversity gap to, to um, close. But there, there are students who are doing this work kind of day in, day out, um, and I guess, you know, joining maybe these spaces in your college, wherever it is, um, and if they don't have one, maybe creating one, you know. Um, well, I know a lot of colleges do, though, have um, recruitment and retention centers that, you know, they host events for um, underrepresented minority students to show up, see what the college is like, and kind of see how they can get there. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the key crucial aspects is this community organizing towards that i think as a whole too it's really important um this is kind of a key thing that we do with code day in general is to recognize that like not all students are going to want to go to something about getting into college because they don't think they want to go to college already and so just kind of like thinking about what the goals of the students that might want to go through this program are and kind of tailoring events toward them, I think is, is a, a pretty big, um, pretty big way to get people in. I know that one of our partner schools um, has been talking about doing some events around like cybersecurity um, and like some other sort of facets of computer science um, at the high school level to try to show students that it's a really cool field to go into and then hopefully get some of those students to to enroll. And these are community colleges. We're talking about like high schools that are predominantly serving lower income students. Um, they're just trying to do events to try to show students like why they should consider getting a degree in computer science versus, you know, trying to work immediately after graduating. So it's kind of another thing is just being aware that a lot of these students maybe don't have that social, the um, social priming from all of their friends, the sort of peer pressure to go to college and, and, you know, we have to kind of justify like why this is going to be something that's worthwhile for you, which is very, you know, dependent on what the student wants to do. Yeah. I think beyond that kind of when you, 
get to industry. Um, a lot of companies, you know, uh, tout their diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, you know, they'll have events um, and where they, you know, it's, the focus is on diversity and inclusion. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I go to some of these events. I'm currently, you know, internship hunting as, as you know, that goes. And some of these events simply don't even have underrepresented minorities in their panels, which is, you know, maybe not a, not a great start to the, the diversity and inclusion um, event. Um, but they, they, they say they will, you know, value diversity and inclusion. Um, but the, far, the furthest that some of these kind of companies will go is creating employee resource groups, you know, where you can get together, have a community within your company, but they don't do the work of reaching out to and recruiting, know absolutely nothing about um, a technical interview or whatever um, kind of, you know, in, in the software industry. And so they can't help me with that. They can't say, here's how your resume is supposed to look. and Here's how to solve, you know, the invert binary tree, for example. You know, and so you can go to your career center, you can ask them, but again, now they're maybe under resourced. And so I think that one of the kind of ways of bringing this all together is, you know, a space like Code Day where you can have these resources these resume reviews these how do i get to technical interviews and through technical interviews how can i um contribute to open source projects how can i learn more about code and that is one of the big things that i think that you know shouldn't be incumbent upon a nonprofit to do but it is good that we are doing it in the in, while you know, big companies aren't. So I have another question then. Do you, because I know that some companies who claim to have diversity and inclusion, they have quote unquote diversity training. Do you think that, you know, that is even helpful or do you think they need to work on that what is what is your, what are your thoughts on like diversity training when people say that they provide that to their employees um i think alex can probably speak to this more you know because i i don't consider my my primary identity is not necessarily like underrepresented in tech, I, I have a very complicated ethnic background, so it's kind of hard to say, but um, I do know like from a, from a, you know, a statistics point of view or like kind of a research point of view, there are ways to do some sort of training that can actually make some amount of a difference. It's not a huge difference, but it's some amount of a difference. But like the way that most companies go about it, I think is kind of like the, the what's the, you know, what's the easiest way to check off this box sort of approach. And like it, it's no surprise that when you're kind of looking at it from like, how can we check the box that we've included this training? Like you're not gonna get anything particularly helpful there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that there are probably ways to do it that are that are better, but it's not, it's not the way that most companies are going about it. And like, then that probably extends to other parts of their business as well, right? Like they, they've got this training, that's great. Like, how are they actually doing outreach to reach more of these students? How are they, um, you know, is the is the recruiting team aware that they should be trying to reach students that aren't just going to really expensive, like big name schools like that, that, that sort of thing is where like if a company is not putting a lot of effort into actually trying to come up with any sort of training that's going to, you know, be, be have any evidence of it actually doing anything, they're probably also not doing putting any work into any other area of the business either. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think a lot of companies are just trying to check off this box that can you know now that they've done it they can say hey you know i've reached diversity and inclusion or their goals for it it um but i think one of the things is that this yeah again because they're not necessarily um you know they they're trying to just 
meet the requirements, they're not going uh, above those requirements. And so the diversity training could very well be lacking in a lot of different aspects. Um, I think that, I think just in general, um, diversity training doesn't do nearly enough to, you know, have people examine their own privileges, their own um, uh, power, and to, to kind of evaluate what power structure there is within society, within their company, within um, their communities. And to say, you know, hey, I w- really want to examine myself and my identities and how that interacts with other people's identities. I think that that's one of the things that diversity training needs to do that it maybe doesn't right now. Um, and I say maybe because I, you know, can't speak on literally every company. Um, but I know that, you know, through, um, you know, I've, I've read some literature on what some of these diversity trainings look like. Um, and it's more like, hey, don't say these things, um, you know, be more respectful. But it, it fails to have people think about kind of the underlying causes between some of these behaviors between um, like why is the company primarily white for example why have them examine that why is you know I think you know recently some news came out about Activision Blizzard um, I'm sure they had you know sexual harassment training um, for their employees but now it comes out that there's been a lot of, you know, very unsavory behavior at Activision Blizzard. Um, and so they, they did probably meet the requirement for um, sexual harassment training. But did it change the office culture? N- n- not quite. Um, so we, in addition to having that training, making sure that it is led by people who are kind of have some skin in the game and who understand the power structures and want people to examine them. And I think that's kind of where that needs to go. Yeah. I mean, for me, it it still goes back to like, we, you know, we need to understand who at the business is not, you know, if we're talking about a, a company, like who is not on board with this and why are they not on board and like making sure that they actually understand that this is a benefit, not only to society and not only because it's good, um, but it, it can also be a benefit to their, you know, the company's performance and their job. Like they, they need to understand that because otherwise what you have is someone from HR who doesn't actually want to make any meaningful change. They just want to check off the box because they've been told to check off the box. And if they checked off the box in a meaningful way, it would have actually provided a lot more value, not only to, to making, you know, making the world better, but it would have also provided more value to them as well. And I, I think they're just not, you know, realizing why that's valuable. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It's, again, yeah, it's, it's about doing more than just checking off the box. And I think that that's where a lot of companies, you know, fall short and, why they need people from these backgrounds in the leadership positions because you know those people will not hopefully will will ask for more than just checking off the box will you know create programs that are actually going to um inspire change within the the company culture and whatnot um so yeah there, there's a lot to be done about diversity training um, and that sort of thing within companies. So let's, um, I think we should talk about then the dif- like how people can differentiate equality and equity um, in the office, in, in tech, in the tech industry. Um, usually there is a lot of confusion between the two. And I definitely wanted to bring this up because um, people just cannot differentiate. How, how do you define the difference between the two, Erica? I'm curious. That is a good question. Um, I have 
I have worked with um, student government and we've gone over the differences before. Um, I think equality is more like everybody being treated the same or um, something along those lines. And equity is more like um, fair and equal payment and you know contribution sort of thing i could be totally wrong um and you know i am asking this question because i need a refresher yeah so i'm in my kind of view um equality means you know access to um different oper- like all everything that everyone has access to right so you shouldn't be um gate kept from uh certain events maybe because of your background or um who you are saying hey you know come to this event if you want you know um use whatever tool you need so having access and having a right to that access an inherent right um and making sure that everyone across the board has those kinds of um, opportunities and and access and rights. Uh, equal, equity, in on the other hand, to me, means, well, how are we going to make sure that everyone's on the same uh, playing field, right? How are we going to make sure that someone who came from a background where they know literally nothing of the industry is on the same playing field as someone whose parents were software engineers and so they've grown up knowing software engineering their entire life right so it's the difference to me is equality means kind of access and equal access across the board well equity means let's get everyone to the same playing level so that everyone can perform at their best yeah, I mean, I think for me, the um, the really big uh, important thing is, is to like is to strive for more of that equity thing, right? Like an example of where this comes up in companies, I think, uh, or certainly comes up in things like government is like, you know, we will advertise our job postings publicly, right? Or we'll advertise our, if you're a government, it's like, we'll advertise our request for bids publicly, right? But if, for anyone who's ever, you know, seen anything in government, you know, like there's a few really big companies that get all the contracts, right? It's the same thing for, for companies. If you're advertising a job application publicly, but you know that all of your applicants are actually going to be from, you know, MIT and Stanford and Berkeley and like all of the really big name, well-known tech companies, you've technically fulfilled the requirement of like equality, but you haven't actually like done anything meaningful to try to increase the, you know, the access for the students who don't come from those colleges because you're just going to ignore their resumes or because they're not going to hear about it or because, you know, whatever else. So I think trying to address those underlying factors is a more important um, cause. And like a really, you know, I mean, a useful way to do that is to just like go and talk to some of these students who aren't applying and just ask them why not. And like, there's a lot of, you know, if we're talking about job postings, like there's a lot of really well documented, well supported in the literature, like reasons why students aren't applying. One of the biggest ones being like, they just don't think intrinsically, they just don't think they're qualified enough. And so like being able to talk to an engineer or something and, and learn more about what the job is like, is like a really good way that that can provide more equity um, versus just the, the equality of, okay, we're going to put our job posting out there. Yeah, no, I actually have uh, been in that position where I've seen job postings and thought to myself, oh, I'm probably not qualified for that because, you know, I don't know X technology um, or, or whatever the case was. Uh, and I think that that's one of the, the things is, how do we make the language in the job postings, you know, in- inclusive and um, accessible? But how do we make sure that those job postings go to everyone, not just who who we target it to, right? Because uh, let's say you, you do post a job posting on LinkedIn. Um, what if X person doesn't have LinkedIn? because they were never told to get a LinkedIn. Um, 
you know, if uh, I blank, I'm kind of blanking on what the other job posting websites are, but you know, it's like, if you've more likely that you've never heard of it, if you don't have a background in, in tech, right? So that's kind of where the, the, the equity thing is, is come into play is, well, let's make sure that not only is it equally accessible to everyone, you know, and posted publicly, but that it, that it reaches everyone, that it, that everyone feels like they can apply for this job. Um, and I think that's a key aspect of, of that uh, conversation. Yeah, I mean, one one really good example of, uh, like you were saying, Alex, about like seeing qualifications and thinking I'm not qualified, like um, there have been a few studies now, and this is speaking generally not true in all the cases, but like on average, uh, men are a lot more likely to apply for a job posting if they uh, think that they meet some of the requirements, even if it says, you know, required. If they meet some of the requirements, men are a lot more likely to submit an application they wouldn't think about where technically they're both seeing the same job posting, but you're much more likely to get uh, men and particularly like men who come from, you know, very solid middle-class background, traditional education. If you put lots of requirements in the job posting, because even if no one will literally meet all of the requirements, you're, they're the ones who are more likely to actually apply there. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, there's a lot of like really small things that you wouldn't even necessarily think of that can impact how people see that. Thank you. I feel like I really needed that. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Hey, Zach, do you want to talk? You want to add a little emoji if you want to talk? Welcome to the room. I'm going to invite him to speak. Can, people can request to speak if they want to, too. There's a little button for it. Yeah, request to speak if you want to add to the conversation. Feel free. Um, Erica, did you want any, uh, anything else for us to talk about on this subject, or are there, are there others? There are some other topics. Um, another good question that I've written down is, um, we kind of sort of addressed it, but um, what would an ideal diverse workplace actually look like, and how does it benefit companies as a whole? Because I think people miss the mark on like what success looks like in diverse in actual diverse workspaces. And I, and I wanted to bring that up in conversation. Yeah. So I, I, I that's kind of one of the things that I have been wondering to recently and just thinking about is, yeah, what, what is, finally reaching diversity look like and you know for a california public college maybe that looks like you know actually uh representing the population's demographics um in terms of you know ethnic identity um gender identity uh sexual orientation um maybe that's the the standard there um I think that that that's that also might be kind of a, a slippery slope because then, you know, you say, well, okay, we'll strive for these goals, but then, kind of end it there, um, and so I don't know if you know just representing the population of the maybe city or state that you're in, is the kind of right answer, and I don't think there's a right answer here particularly. Um, but I, you know, maybe starting that might be like a kind of starting place to aim towards is representing people, at least in in the way that they show up in demographics. Um, and then that, that begs the question, well, demographics of what area? Because if you look at the U.S., um, my college is doing just fine if not a little um better in in um you know over representing minorities um but if you look at the california demographics maybe they're not doing nearly as good as they could be 
Um, so it's, and then if you look at my the city that my college is in, it looks nothing like the demographics. Um, so it it's kind of a bigger conversation than I think we could tackle today or even in the coming years. Um, but I think that that's kind of a good place to shoot for is, you know, m- let's maybe not have a particular um, minority be only a fraction of what they are in your location's demographics. Right. And um, in some videos I've watched about, like, diversity in the workplace, um, some TikToks as well, is that, like, when people, when companies say that they're diverse, what it really looks like when you're looking at, you know, their staff um, and their employees, you see that people of color and minorities are actually, they have lower roles in the company and they are not moving up the chain. Like you see mostly white people at the top and people of color at the bottom in, you know, roles that just aren't as strong as they could be. And they work for years, for years. And they watch, you know, their, you know, they, they see white people that come in even early, like later or earlier on, or sorry, later on than them get these higher positions. And I think that like, that is where that is where the change needs to happen is that you need to consider way more in, in somebody's, you know, ability to do their job and consider way more who is qualified for a raise or for a higher position. Am I making sense? I think it makes sense. And I I think that the, um, the way that I, I always look at this at least is I think that this isn't, this this will always be kind of an ongoing journey I, like we should always be improving um we have not been improving i mean like just you know to be frank like the, the cs industry as a whole generally has not really improved too much um but i think it's something that should always be improving because there's always there's always things like that and like that, that the thing that you just brought up erica i think is a really important one um and like not just get, you know i mean i think traditionally people are focused on like okay can we get more people in the door right can we get more people from a diverse background in the door and and they do that but then they don't pay attention to people who are moving up into leadership roles so that's a problem right um people have been very focused on women for a very long time in the tech industry and and like it was i think it's only been maybe within the past 10 or 15 years that people have actually started to look and say, oh, we're also really not getting any people who are uh, Black or, or uh, Latino, Latina, um, or um, are Native American. Like, that's something that's only recently been been a big thing. Um, people with disabilities, a lot of software is still not very accessible um, because it's not being made uh, by people who are, are blind or, you know, have um, a disability with their eyesight or are uh, hard of hearing or things like that. That's another really big one that that needs to be more represented in our industry. Um, representing, you know, most of the technology is made in the U.S., uh, but a lot of people come from, you know, not only extreme poverty, but like extreme poverty on a scale that's much more, you know, uh, extreme than we're used to in the U.S. Um, and so, uh, you know, software and, and technologies that can help them access some of the cool things that we're making are also is kind of an aspect of, uh, you know, bringing more representation to the tech industry. So it's like, I feel like it's one of those things where it's certainly much more than just making sure that you meet the, you know, that you have the same representation that you would locally, you know, that you have the the same percentage of people from different backgrounds as, you know, your local demographics in your city or something. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there personally, because I feel like as we improve in one area, there's always going to be somewhere else to improve, but you know, it does, it makes technology so much better as a whole. So um, I don't know if that's my take on it. (laughs) Yeah. I think I I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, Yeah. Like one of the, the big things that I think about is, you know, maybe when Amazon, for example, says that, you know, they have a really diverse workplace. Well, what do they mean by that? Do they mean that, the people um, at the the warehouses are, you know, primarily um, 
underrepresented minorities, or do they mean that at all levels, including their software engineering department, are um, diverse? Because I, you know, you can only imagine that the software engineering uh, department will be less diverse than, let's say, the 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 warehouse um, employees, um, and so you know that that are getting paid a lot less than these software engineers. Um, and so it, it's just, you know, beware of when companies say, hey, we're, we're diverse, um, you know, unless you, you, you know that they're only a software company. So if they say that, it's going to be within their engineers, right? Um, and then again, like you were mentioning, Erica, like the, the mobility is a big aspect of it because you can say that, you know, I, I'm sure – my college will say that it's very um, that it's it's meeting some d- diversity goal that it has, but again, the CS Honor Society info session that I went to, um, not a single underrepresented minority in sight. Like so, the, it's as you go further up the chain, there there is less and less diversity, and. I think to truly be diverse, you need to be go ahead and represent people at every level of the chain. Sorry, I was having some uh, technical difficulties. Um, I think that you worded that perfectly, and I don't really have any follow up. Um, is everyone ready to move on to um, another topic question? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Um, ooh, a good one is um, how do we make sure we are hearing people and truly helping them when they are being misrepresented in tech? Uh, so I, I guess, question for you, what do you be, mean by misrepresented? Like underrepresented people of color, people um, LGBTQ, AAPI, folks that just don't really see themselves in the industry or feel that they don't belong in the industry or on, are oftentimes Mm -hmm. unwelcome okay yeah i I totally get you now um so yeah i think that's one of the 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 things that if you think of you know um a hacker or a coder or, or whatnot you have this kind of stereotypical image in your head already of you know maybe a white guy in um sweats and a t-shirt at his computer all day um, you know, that, that might just be the stereotype you have. It comes from, you know, the media, um, movies, TV shows, whatever, wherever it may come from. But I, I don't, that's definitely not the case, right? That's not how everyone kind of is, um, everyone looks and is in the industry, right? So, we need to break down these kind of stereotypes and uh, images that are already present. And that's kind of hard to do, especially when the media is perpetuating these stereotypes. Um, But one way we can start is by having people of color, uh, women, um, queer people, trans people coming out um, to events and telling people, Hey, this is what, real software engineers look like this it's not just you know maybe white men in um an office you know just coding all day um i think that that's one of the one one thing that we can do kind of you know just straight out the gate um to kind of help break down that stereotype but there there are those those images that are you know 
discourage underrepresented minorities from viewing themselves as software engineers when in reality they could be if they if they wanted to um you know it it is a difficult journey but they they can definitely do it and they you know there's no looking like a software engineer right just the way same way that there's no looking like a, a grocery uh store cashier or a starbucks barista right so I, I think that the, 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 the kind of images um, are, are, are very kind of harmful um, to people and their, their self-image and seeing what they want to achieve. And I honestly, I think it goes back to um, like when you look at job postings, again, seeing yourself in that position, can you see yourself in that position? Um, like Tyler mentioned, women on average, are less likely to apply if they don't meet some of the requirements. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult, too, because, again, there's so many different aspects to what someone can look like and how they identify and things, too. I mean, it wasn't until we did Code Day Labs um, these past two years that, uh, you know, that we started to meet students who were, like, in their 30s or 40s who were just planning to go into computer science now. Or, like, we had, you know, uh, veterans who are planning to go into computer science now. Um, like there's just like that, you, that's, that's an aspect, an example of an aspect of this that I, I never even thought of um, when I think about like software engineers is like, you know, someone who maybe is on their second career is not what I typically thought of as a, a software engineer, but it's like, no, of course they could be. Um, so yeah, I mean like having more of those people, you know, visible, like trying to, to spotlight more of those people, you know, if you're having a conference or something like that, like trying to get more of those people on stage by really promoting in areas where they're likely to find it and like making sure that they feel really comfortable, I think is a, a really good way to do it. It's also tricky too, though, because again, you know, I think with any of this, you can imagine how a company who's trying to just check the box can do this in kind of like the most useless way. And like I, you know, an example of that is I remember talking to some people about this a while ago and uh, th their conclusion basically their takeaway from this entire thing was we should you know add some more pink to our website and it's like that's not going to help anything um that's completely missing the point and you know again it's kind of like that we're going to check off this box mentality of like diversity that doesn't actually make any difference so it's like yeah it's, it's pretty difficult in terms of like you, you really need people to, to be kind of working to try to find ways to actually spotlight these people and make sure that that you know, people who are newer to the software industry do see people like them in an authentic way. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, and one of the other things I want to bring up is having spaces where uh, people of a certain identity can come and kind of, you know, share in their identity, support each other. Um, because I, I think that that's a really kind of nice thing to have is that support system of people who can say hey yeah I've also felt this or this um, you know we see it all, all, all the time um, at colleges where we have um, you know our retention and recruitment centers where they're just spaces of certain identity to help people come into to the college maybe join their space after and i think that that's really good to see um one thing that was really nice is over the past two years all of my um code day labs mentees um you know interns have all been women um and so they've gotten to you know see each other who are taking this journey you know to college to find an internship um, through college um, and they're able to kind of go through this journey together whereas sorry excuse me uh, if they were with you know uh, men in their their group maybe they would not feel as comfortable sharing an idea or whatnot and so having these spaces where you can take a step back from maybe whatever microaggressions or whatever you're feeling and being feeling like you can 
share, like you can um, talk with people who have a similar lived experience as you is really crucial. Um, you know, I, uh, un- yeah, unfortunately, I, I think that they would have been a little more served by having uh, a woman as a, a mentor. Um, but I am glad that I, I got to kind of share my experiences and say, hey, here's how I got to college. Here's how I can help you also, you know, get to college, you know, help you review your essays. Um, and so kind of passing out some of that knowledge um, is, is kind of, again, crucial. And being able to do it in spaces where people can share with it within their, their lived experiences and their identity it is a very crucial thing to breaking down those stereotypes. To add to that, I also think that like, it's important for professors to like call on women more, center them in the conversation in class. Um, and it's important for companies to like not make people feel bad for being gay. Um, like acknowledge that, you know, anyone is welcome in tech and like help center people in a very positive way. And it's, you know, not to sound so brutal, but like stamp out any negativity towards women and people of color in the office, like really tackle the issues head on and make people feel seen, make people feel heard. Because a lot of the time and in a lot of research I've done um, specifically for uh, LGBTQ, I did a little bit of research on on LGBTQ in tech, um, you know, in their programs, they drop out early because they don't feel welcome or and they quit their jobs because they don't feel like they can be out and fully themselves in, in the workplace. Um, there's just too, too much flexibility on what can be talked about in the office at times and um, people just feel super uncomfortable and unsafe. Um, and I think that companies really need to be more aware of like the social aspects, not just how the company is run, but socially how people interact with each other and how people address each other in the workplace as well. I agree with you, by the way, Erica. I don't have anything to add to it, though. Yeah, that that was great. Okay, I was like, could people? Can people hear me? Because sometimes, um, Twitter Spaces uh shuts down, and yeah, I'm glad that 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 was a good point. Let me find another question. Um, do you have anything to add, Alex? Oh, uh, no, 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 I was, go ahead. <laughs> well, the last thing that I wrote down is actually um, something that we didn't address yet, and I wanted to open the room with it, but we can, you know, talk about it now. Um how do we really define the diversity gap in tech and you know what what is it exactly so that we can pick it apart and identify it better in our everyday lives it doesn't just have to be tech related yeah i think sometimes it's hard to conceptualize these things because they're not very quantifiable, right? Um, it's it's hard to put statistics to, um, you know how are how are we doing as, as like within diversity and inclusion? You can say you know hey I'll I'll get demographics and statistics on um, like this and that, um, and so if if you wanted to put statistics to it, I think the the best thing to put statistics to is kind of like 
who are, who's getting these jobs within each demographic um, out of how many have applied, how many are getting the jobs, right? So if it's like 10% over every demographic, you're probably not excluding people, um, at least within the interview process. Um, and that's probably the, the better way of, of doing that other, rather than, um, you know, hey, how many of each demographic do we have? You can kind of get into a a kind of bad starting place with that, um, in in my opinion. But I think it's it's a more it's a cultural thing, societal thing, where you can't really tell, you know, quantifiably how you're doing, right? You you're not going to be able to say, yes, I've um, experienced no racism today or no uh, homophobia or uh, transphobia today, right? That, that's while that's a good thing to strive for, I, I don't know if you can necessarily say that. Um, but I think it starts to, to come together when people of underrepresented backgrounds feel like they belong there like they deserve to be there they have a right to be there um and you know there's always that kind of possibility of of like imposter syndrome um but i think making sure that's kind of my um standard for it, am i being inclusive is do people feel like they belong here if the answer is yes, then you're probably doing something right. If the answer is no, then you need to ask yourself, why is it no? Why, how can I help people feel included? And how can I include more people? Um, and people with different perspectives, right? Um, I think that's kind of where my standard is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good standard. And when, like, the the only thing that I would add is just to say, like, again, there's a lot of different demographics to to consider when you're thinking about um, inclusivity uh, in the workplace. And so it's not just making sure that people are getting hired from, you know, who are women or or non-binary or you know, like any any gen- marginalized gender in the tech industry, but also um, different uh, ethnicities is another one. And I think that's certainly caught on now. Like, people are aware of it. Um, it wasn't until Erica started working for us that we really, for Code Day even, we started looking at uh, LGBTQ um, plus uh, folks, right? So that wasn't even something that we were thinking about at the time. Um, that's another group that is often marginalized in technology. Um, you have people who are from lower income backgrounds, um, from across the spectrum of gender and ethnicity and things like that. But even, you know, even if they're you know, super white males who are typically in the tech industry, if they come from a low income background, they're not very likely to get into that. And they're likely to stay very low income, which is, uh, you know, a problem. Um, I always like to pick on accessibility because the tech industry as a whole really does not care that much about accessibility. And like having people with different disabilities can help make software uh, available to a lot more people. Um, and then there's also, you know, actual geography. Um, so if you're, you know, only building software in Silicon Valley, you're only going to build software for people in Silicon Valley. And I'm not even talking about internationally alone, like even for people in Kansas or something like that, it's, you know, it's going to be very different. Um, and, and there's so many other aspects that you could, you could look at, you know, you could look at, um, political backgrounds, like having, you know, a diversity in, in those viewpoints, having a diversity in lived experiences. Like there's so many different ways to, to look at it. Um, and I, I would, you know, as much as possible, try to focus on, on improving it in, in a lot of those different aspects. Of course, like when you're trying to do things like gather data and your sample sizes too, because you've defined too many groups that you're trying to look at, that gets a little bit more difficult, but um, just being aware that it's, you know, diversity is more than just increasing the number of women in the tech industry or something like that, but that there's a lot of ways in which people are marginalized um, and their, their views aren't heard. Yeah. And I, I think this kind of goes to the idea of intersectionality is that, you know, people don't just have one identity. They have 
a multitude of identities um, within themselves and, you know, examining each one, each different one and how that uh, plays a role into how you're perceived, how you perceive things. Um, and that, that understanding that's going to, you know, change the outcomes of some of the conversations you have, some of the interviews you have. Um, but yeah, it, I think that that was a really good point. All right, that uh, concludes all of my questions. Do you guys have anything that you'd like to add or bring up that you felt um, wasn't relevant earlier or any, any more comments? Tyler, uh, you want to go first? Uh, I mean, the only real comment that I have, um, like I, I've brought this up many times, but I think the most important thing is just that like a lot of people look at uh, increasing diversity as a way to tick the box. And I think that certainly people who are listening to this are probably not those people on board with actually trying to do meaningful changes. I think that that's, really important. Um, looking at what else is already out there, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Like there's a lot of nonprofits that have been trying to do this for a long time, not only Code Day, but a lot of other nonprofits. And just trying to look at what's already out there. Um, there's a lot of things that that companies can take back um, and can, um, can use for their own things. Things like Code Day Labs, for example, like we have a lot of access to community college students who are older, who may be looking for um, who certainly are looking for jobs and like that's a great resource for employers who are looking to hire um, college new grads. Um, so just, you know, as you're starting to build this out and trying to get more um, buy-in internally, like looking at what else is out there and, and seeing how you can work with them. Cause there's a lot of nonprofits who've been trying to do good in this area for a very long time. Um, and other than that, I just wanted to thank, uh, you know, Alex for, for all of your perspectives and also Erica for arranging this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, it's 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 a big conversation and um like yeah, like you said Tyler, people who are here are probably the ones who you know are not perpetuating these stereotypes um are the ones that are not just taking these boxes. And so if, for me it's like kind of like always the question is what can I do to to help? Um and I think that it's it's starts local, right? You gotta reach out to your community, find who who's feeling affected by this kind of non acceptance in the the tech industry. Reaching out to them, giving them resources. Um, maybe you want to do that through a nonprofit, um, through Code Day, through Code Day Labs. And that's that's great. I think that these are programs that are really gonna help. But making sure that you are doing this kind of locally and more more on an individual level is what you can do right now to start fixing things in the tech industry um, because it, it does start at at the bottom and goes it goes up. You know a lot of the times we wish that we can kind of change the power structure from the top, but oftentimes that's just not how it works. Um, and so starting with your behavior, changing if, you know, there's something you're doing that's potentially harmful, changing that. Um, and then reaching out to others and making sure that they have, they feel supported, that they feel like they can see succeed in the tech industry and they, they feel like they be belong. I think that that's kind of what's next, right? What do I do? Um, that That's kind of my thoughts on that. Um, and just, you know, for everyone listening at home um, later on, you know, that's kind of what you can do now to start fixing some of these problems that we talked about. Um, but other than that, no, I, thank you for having me. Um, really good perspective, Tyler. And thank you for organizing this, Erica. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to do this. This is our very first space. 
Um, we didn't have a lot of people enter. I know part of that is probably because people are working. Um, but I think this was successful. And I think we should try to do more and explore more topics and engage more with the community because I, I do genuinely like having these conversations. And I think they're really important. So thank you for allowing, you know, allowing this conversation to happen. Um, and I look forward to doing more. Thank you, Erica. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.